Hey, everybody. Welcome to this episode of Think Business Live, a Think Business exclusive. Uh, looking forward to having my co-host with me, uh, Sue. It's great to, to see you. Uh, Sue Soboleski is the controller at Dems Development. And so um, we, we are interviewing John Strzelecki. Uh, John, I'm going to talk a little bit about you. I, I learned about you uh, through Sue, so I thought it'd be fun to have her co-host with me today. So uh, John is a best-selling author, um, authored uh, many best-selling inspirational books, including one of the main books we're going to talk about today, uh, one of my favorite books now, um, The Cafe at the Edge of the World, Return to the Y Cafe, The Big Five for Life, and The Big Five for Life um, online course, which we'll talk a little bit about. John, you sold over 7 million copies worldwide, and it's been translated into 43 languages, uh, before becoming an author, uh, you had a high stress job that you ended up quitting and um, basically went on a one year backpacking trip and came back and started writing. Um, yeah. I, a lot of people would love to quit their jobs and go on a one year backpacking <laughs> trip uh, to just kind of, you know, detox from especially the last two years. But, you know, John, I learned about your book because Sue called me and said, John, you got to read this book. And then it's a it's an amazing read. It's a quick read, and then call me to discuss it when you're done, which I which I did, and then I did. And so, so I'm going to let you kick off kind of the origin of how you found the book, and then ask John the first question that's uh, that's on your mind. Very good. I will. Uh, in December of last year, a girlfriend of mine who's very close to me and one of those people that you can talk about anything with. Uh, gave me your book for my birthday and said, I hope that you find some peace as uh, you've been going through a lot lately and maybe this will help. So I sat down and again, like John said, it was such an easy read. And for me, who's always pressed for time and people stealing my time, uh, your book resonated with me very quickly, uh, especially when this chapter about the girl with the turtle at the ocean, uh, how do you stop the incoming? And I was just like, God, I wish somebody could answer that. <laughs> so I immediately went to my business coach, John, who we have sometimes very deep conversations like that. And I'm like, John, you have to read this book and then you have to call me because I want to know how to stop the incoming because uh, it never seems to go away. Uh, and that was the one piece that if I could find the answer, uh, stop the emails, stop people, just so that I can find where I need to be in a level ground, I feel like I wouldn't be so tired all the time. So that yeah. was the big question I got out of the book more so than you called it uh, your purpose. I have always said to my children, what's your pop, your purpose on the planet? And mm, even in sarcastic that. times when they were young, they would go, well, what's your purpose? <laughs> I would tell them, I'm your mother. My purpose <laughs> is to make sure you're a grown up, successful adult on your own. Uh, but now here we are, they're all adults, and now I have to find my own new purpose, right? I'm not just their mom anymore. So that's my search right now. All right. That's, that's beautiful. Well, first of all, thank you so much for recommending the book. Please thank your friend for me. Uh, I can't tell you the number of times when I've done signings and I ask people, how did you hear about the book? And almost always it is my best friend gave it to me or my mom gave it to me or it's a person who cared about someone else who gave it to someone else. It's like 95% of the time. And I'm always so grateful for that because that, that really is the highest honor when someone recommends something that they care about to someone else that they care about. So thank you. Thank your friend for me. And then thank you for recommending it to John. Very good. So, well so tell us about the incoming. So let's go back to Sue's, you know, yeah. element of, and I, cause I think a lot of people are experiencing that right now, you know, um, you know, you can't even sit at your computer without, you know, news coming. Hey, inflation is higher. Uh, right. Supply chain is going to continue to be worse. The, the war, which my thoughts and prayers go out to everybody in the Ukraine. You know, so many things, um, interest rates on the rise. I mean, there's so much incoming and then there's business and then there's family and then there's just everything else. Yeah. So the, the essence of that story for the folks who are listening who haven't read the book is that one of the main characters is trying to figure out her life and she goes swimming in the ocean and sees a sea turtle 
and she at, at the start tries to keep up with the sea turtle to watch it and soon discovers that despite paddling nonstop, she is unable to keep up with the turtle. And then she goes back into the water a second day and notices something significant, which is that the, the sea turtle is not paddling all the time. It actually is in this tremendous state of flow and that when the waves are coming into its face, when the obstacles are coming at it, it just sort of holds its ground. And then when the momentum of the wave is behind it, that's when it really gives momentum and energy. And the takeaway for our lives is very similar in that there are constant sources coming at us, trying to distract us for all of our resources. And that includes our time, that includes our energy, that includes our financial resources. And if we're not careful, we're paddling all the time with every distraction and everything that's trying to attract us. And at the end of the day, when the thing we really want to spend our resources on is available, we don't have any more time. We don't have any more attention. We don't have any more financial resources. So the huge takeaway is to be incredibly selective about how much paddling we do uh, and making sure that it's in alignment with what I now call your big five for life, the five things that you most want to do, see or experience in your lifetime. And uh, to, your, to your question, Sue, for me, what enables me to have that level of focus is knowing what the five things are for me literally enables me to look at the CNN window or whatever the pop-up is or whatever and instantly be like, nope, 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 nope. <laughs> it just gives me tremendous <laughs> clarity. Uh, do, you, do you remember David Letterman when he used to be on mainstream TV? Of course. Yes. Yeah. Letterman used to have this thing that he did that used to crack me up as a kid. And it is so useful for our lives. He used to dress up in a Velcro suit and jump off of a trampoline and stick to the Velcro wall. Yeah, I remember that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah and it, it used to crack me up every time. And the takeaway as it relates to this conversation is that when those things are trying to get my attention, energy, and time, I think to myself, if I was holding one of my big five for life in my hand and I threw it up against that item, would it stick or not? Is it related? Is it connected? Is it somehow helping me move forward? Or is it simply a distraction? And that to me has been an absolute life-changing way in which I look at my, my, my day, my plan, everything that's coming at me. That's yeah. excellent. Does that help Sue? Is that, is that, Oh yeah, it does. It, it's been just like the gentleman in the book. How do you start executing? Right. It resonates and you know, right. You do know exactly where all the, pro the incoming's coming and you even say, okay, I'm not going to, look at it. I'm going to delete it from my phone so I don't look yeah. at Facebook or some social media. And yet you find that you feel like you miss it, right? So you have to find a way to disconnect. So let me let me give you a tiny bit of advice in that regard. Um, the It's actually, I just wrote uh, the fourth book in the Cafe series, which won't be coming out in English for a while, but there's a piece in there which is tied to this. So I'll, I'll share it anyway. And that is that these algorithms are unbelievable and they, they like to create what I call just enough dopamine to keep you pleasantly occupied. And so <laughs> it's so like true. a low level drug. It just keeps you pleasantly occupied. But the, the yeah. problem is that nobody wants to go through life and, and get to the end and look back and be like, ah, oh, look at that. I was so pleasantly occupied the whole time. What we want is these wonderful moments, the moments when you are there a hundred percent with your kids, if you're a parent, or uh, John, I know that you're an athlete. So those moments where you're, you're in the midst of the athletic competition and you're just in joy for the experience of the game. And so if we allow ourselves to experience amazing, then pleasantly occupied is no longer sufficient. Yeah. And so to me, and it's not about cutting something out necessarily, Sue, from, from my practical experience of what works for me. It's about tasting life at its finest and whatever that means for you and your big five for life. So if you want to go travel, then get on a plane, go to Africa and experience it. Because once you've tasted that, pleasantly occupied is not going to be sufficient. And it won't feel like you're having to restrict yourself. It'll feel like you're enabling yourself towards something much more special. Yeah. I love Makes that. I, 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 let's yeah. rewind for a second, John, because I, I want to, I want to talk about, the mental state, the mindset, the uh, the frequency, the vibration that you were at when you wrote your first book. So take us back for a minute, right? You're in this career, um, it's high stress, and yeah. then you disconnect. I, I'm using, I'm making that word up. Maybe you didn't completely disconnect, but you 
you go out and you start traveling the world for a year. Yeah. And and so what did you need to shed to then come back and reconnect? And then yeah. and, and this is a multi-tier question, but then when you reconnected, was it more obvious what you could shed? To 100%. kind of back up what Sue's saying. So yeah, take us on, tell us a little bit about that journey. 100%. So this was, there's many aspects of this, which I think ties into your question, Sue, and hopefully for anybody who's listening, um, helps them with where they're at in their own life as well. So first for me was I had, since I was a little kid, dreamed of seeing the world. I used to read Tarzan books when I was a little kid. I read every one of Edgar Rice Burroughs in that entire series. I read every book about the Wild West. At my core, what I wanted to be was an adventurer. And here I was in the middle of a very non-adventurous sort of mainstream life. I was, I was well paid for what I did. Uh, I was pretty well treated. Uh, it was incredibly high stress, but I just wasn't happy. And I was looking at the people that were 10 years older than me. And, and it was very obvious that if I kept doing what I was doing, then I was going to be that person 10 years from then. And there came this deciding moment where I said, I just can't do that. I was 32 years old and I didn't want to get to 42 and be that guy. And so uh, yeah, I, I decided that I was going to leave it all behind and go backpack around the world, which when you're in your 30s and you tell people that they look at you like you're an absolute nut job. You know, OK, yeah, you do that when you're 18 or you do that as a gap year in college, but you don't do that when you're in your 30s. Your career is going good. Like, that's just crazy. And I remember writing in my journal that there were a thousand reasons why this trip made no sense before I left. But literally, uh, to both of you, after one week on the road, not one of those thousand reasons made sense anymore. Uh, and it was because I didn't know exactly what was out there waiting for me. But man, oh, man, it's like I talked about with going to Africa. Once I was out there, it was such a state of bliss and joy that all of these seemingly major obstacles didn't hold the same weight anymore. And I had dreamed of seeing animals in the wild. I had dreamed of meeting people from different cultures. I had dreamed of seeing like all these amazing places. And so, and it wasn't that uh, I was like, oh my gosh, this is, you know, going to be the way I spend the rest of my life. But I just knew in that moment, that's what I needed to do. And there's a big takeaway there because I realized and continue to realize that the second great adventure can only start after the first great adventure. I had to take this big leap of faith into the unknown not knowing exactly what it was going to lead to, but trusting that this is where my heart was guiding me, even if it made no sense to anybody else. And this year changed my life. I, I just cannot even tell you the number of ways in which I saw the world different, including the fact to your point, John, like literally when you're backpacking around the world, all you have is what fits in a bag that goes from your right. butt to your head. So uh, it, and, and I was never happier than I was during that year. Uh, and all I had was those possessions. And so it quickly taught me that all the rest of that stuff didn't mean as much to me. Now I'm not saying that's not important to other people, but for me, it was about the experiences and the memories and the moments that mattered. The stuff didn't really matter anymore. So I came back. I didn't know what I was going to do. Uh, it was like two weeks before I was coming back. I got an email from a guy saying, Hey, are you back in the country? I need a consultant. I heard you might be coming back. I didn't really know what I was going to do when I came back and I was kind of out of money. And so I was like, sure, I'll take the game. And so crazy enough, it was actually in Detroit, which is, I know, in your neck of the woods. John. Yeah. And uh, so I, Detroit in February. And granted, I had spent a year backpacking <laughs> around the world in warm weather, exactly because I'm not a cold weather guy. So I go up to Detroit February. I do another consulting assignment, automotive space. And it was everything that I'd left. It was like backbiting corporate cultures and stuff I didn't really care about. I'm coming back on a flight, my last flight from the assignments, and I was sitting on the tarmac thinking to myself, what would I tell someone right now is the meaning of life? Because I had this whole year of nirvana, and then I had this kind of, kind of coming back to this reality in love. I started writing out a speech. I woke up the next morning, and something inside of me said, sit down and type. And I ended up typing stream of conscious nonstop for 21 days, and that became the cafe on the edge of the world. And we wouldn't be having this conversation today had I not taken that big leap and gone off and backpacked around the world because that opened up that space. Mm -hmm. Nice. That's beautiful. That's a crazy long story, but I wanted to share it because A, you prompted it with the question and B, because I think all of us on some level have something inside of us, which is the dream like that. And the question yeah. is, are we going to take a step into the unknown or not? Yeah. So you got a question? If not, I have a question. You can go next. 
Okay. Uh, that's no, I want to I want to talk about that because I want to talk about fulfillment for a second, right? Because that's a big piece of your book. The book I wrote actually is also about fulfillment, and I've always followed fulfillment and my gut. Um, you know, I I remember I left a, a a pretty great job that nobody, as you're echoing, nobody understood why I would leave, but I I just wasn't personally fulfilled. I wanted to start my own business. Nobody understood it but I didn't care. I think one of the things we're seeing is, is, is kind of a world right now post COVID. I don't know if I can even say post COVID, but post um, COVID the way it has been the last two years. Right. And so, you know, where people are really looking for fulfillment, where they're spending more time zooming into their own personal values, making sure that they're in alignment with the company values and they're moving towards more, fulfillment, right? Uh, people can call it fulfillment, enlightenment, um, on purpose, whatever that is, they want to be more centered and in alignment with themselves. Yeah. And so to so the person who's having a hard time seeing what's in front of them or getting to that space, how do you, um, yeah, I read a book many years ago called Living Your Yoga. And it, the book was basically about Yoga isn't about doing it at yoga. It's about doing it in real time in your life. Can you live yoga off the mat? And so how would you recommend people, and I say it from your, you know, from your hiking experience to tapping into that energy, how would you recommend people tap into whatever space they need to, to actually find fulfillment? Okay, so a whole bunch of things leap to mind when you ask that. So I'm going to follow my intuition and roll with a bunch of these. So stop me, pause me, ask me questions in the middle. But here's a very fast version of everything that's flowing through my head. Yeah. Um, the first one is that think about what you love to do on the weekends and ask yourself, how do I take the genius that is inside of me and get paid to do what I love to do on the weekends? And I'm a firm believer that somebody is out there, not just one person, but tons of people that are already getting paid to do what you would love to get paid to do. Mm -hmm. And I think of it in the context of someone is doing your dream job, so it might as well be you. And if that means that you have skills that are your genius as an accountant, but on the weekends you love to go kayaking, then become a uh, accountant for a kayaking company or for an outdoor outfitter company or something that kind of blends the two together. Uh, and that seems so obvious in the context of having a discussion, but. I went through my entire life. Nobody ever suggested that to me. And so yeah. I realized it seems obvious once you know it, but it's not so obvious until you know it. So hopefully for everybody Correct. who's listening, that clicks and connects. And these days, technology makes that ever easier. Maybe that's one of the great benefits of COVID is that you can do that job remotely if the company that you want to work for isn't next door to you. Um, and if it's not and you can't do it remotely, then maybe ask the question, may, maybe I actually would love to move to where that company is and ask yourself the question, why? So combining your work and the, the things you love to do on the weekend is unbelievable. And just to give you a simple analogy of why that is so powerful, and I can't remember the exact math, I've actually broken this down, but you get about four extra lives for that. And the reason you get four extra lives is if you think about, okay, on the weekends, I spend about eight hours doing the thing that I love. But the weekday, I spend 40 hours a week on my job. Well, if I actually did my job in alignment with the things that I love, it's probably not going to be 100% of the time. But let's say you get four to five uh, of those days that you're actually like, whoa, this is awesome. Then you're kind of getting four extra lives out of that deal. And that's a pretty good trade. And yeah, it may not be instantaneous. You may have to do a little work for that. But man, oh man, the payoff is so well worth it. So that's the first one. Um, the second one is, okay, in what way can I find this clarity about what I would do if I was not doing what I'm doing? Well, I, I can't tell you how powerful it is to spend time in nature and ask the very first question on the cafe menu, which is, why am I here? And it's not asking the question, why am I here in this room? Why am I here in this interview? It's asking, why do I exist? And this, again, such a profound life question. And I spent the entirety of my life with nobody ever asking me, Hey, just out of curiosity, like, why do you think that you got life? You know, yeah. statistically it's 28,900 days. Why do you think you got this gift and what do you want to do with it? And so, Hey, if nobody else is going to ask you that question, then ask it of yourself. And the best place to do this is when you are not distracted. So go for a walk near the ocean. If you have an ocean nearby, go for a walk in the woods, now, just, you know, turn everything else off and just ask yourself that question. 
And we live in such a, oh my gosh, Instagram instantaneous world. It's hard to do this. So don't get me wrong. I'm not saying it's going to be effortless for you, but again, well worth the effort that ask this question more than once. So don't just go on one day and be like, well, I don't know. It, <laughs> it wasn't there. I'm not getting the answer. <laughs> Screw it. I'm going back to pleasantly occupied. Right. Uh, because as an athlete, uh, you realize that it is the training that gets you ready for the big moments in the competition. And to me, going for a walk in the woods and doing it for seven days in a row, asking yourself undistracted, why am I here? I cannot tell you how much farther you're going to be on the path to answering that question than you were on day one. But you got to stay with it and let the universe and your unconscious mind talk through a whole bunch of layers that have probably been acquired over the years. Mm. It's super powerful, super easy to do. Yeah. Um, another great tip, ask people who are super good, close friends of yours, who are non-judgmental, super nice people, like, what do you think I'm good at? Like, what do you, when, when are the moments when I seem to shine the most? We often have these blinders on, you know, that you sort of hear the story of the beautiful person who, who does not see themselves. They don't see themselves as beautiful or the person who is incredibly charismatic and they have a very low self-esteem. Sometimes we can't see who we really are. And so let people who are close to you that are nice people tell you what you do really well. And then ask yourself, okay, so who's got that sort of attribute who's doing a job that sounds absolutely fascinating? Learn everything you can about those people and start to map yourself along that path. It's incredible the resources we have to learn about other people these days. And then it's just a matter of execution. Can I take that knowledge? Am I willing to put in the time and the energy and start to believe that I could live that life too? Mm. Sorry, that's a huge download, but those- No, it was great. It was great. It was like a sermon. I loved it. Yeah. <laughs> and it kind of leads to the question in your book where you said, why do we spend so much time preparing when we can do what we want instead of you know, yeah. waiting? So, so I'll tell you where the another defining moment is. You know, we most of us know someone uh, who has passed away way before the years should have justified it. Um, statistically speaking, the average life twenty eight thousand nine hundred days, but that's an average, which means hopefully we get a little bit more. But some people get a little bit less. I know people like that. You probably know people in your own lives. Same for everybody who's listening. And the problem with having a near death experience is that you get really close to death, and sometimes you don't get that second shot. Kind of that archetype image is the person who's, you know, in the hospital on the way or excuse me, in the ambulance on the way to the hospital. And they have that. Oh, my gosh, I'm going to stop smoking. Uh, I'm going to stop working 80 hour weeks. I'm going to spend more time with my kids. We don't have to get to the near death experience to have that moment. The other way to do it, which is way safer, is to have what I call the near life experience. And that's when you allow yourself to touch as close as possible, the greatness that you want to experience. And whether that is getting on a plane, going to Africa, sitting in a safari vehicle, and literally having zebras and giraffes and elephants walk within 10 feet of you, which I highly, highly recommend as a total game changer, or whether that is you jumping on a kayak and experiencing a class four or class five river and seeing how that changes your heart rate, uh, or whether that is literally you taking every Friday for an entire month and doing nothing but spending it in the park with your kid. It's totally up to you. But having those near life experiences, that is what propels you to make the changes. Otherwise, it's just theoretical. But once you have them, it's cellular. And when it's cellular, you you, you have the momentum to make the change. Mm. Yeah, oh, I have one other great idea. Sorry. Yeah. You, guys, you want one more? No. Yeah, of course. Yeah. Okay, so the brain wants to do one thing. The brain wants to do the same thing it did yesterday. Like that is its primary goal is to keep you alive. And so it's thinking, well, you know, whatever John and Sue did yesterday, like let's just have them do that same thing because it worked out great. We're not dead. We didn't get stepped on by a woolly mammoth. The saber-toothed tiger didn't eat us. So let's just keep doing the same thing. This was a wonderful defense mechanism back in the time when there were saber-toothed tigers and woolly mammoth. But today it's totally different. But that system is still in place. And so to pretend that it's not there is going to set us up for failure. But there is a simple method that I've learned over the years that is so effective. So have you ever gone to the grocery store and there's someone there with like a tray of stuff or actually this is before COVID primarily, but they like have samples, <laughs> right? They, they've, yeah. they've got samples. They're in a little cups by 
I go to. Publix I miss samples. I miss. I know, right? Yeah, the deli. Yeah, the deli. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. So yeah. this is going to change your life, everybody who's listening. If you just allow the next three minutes to sink in, why is it that they give you a sample? Well, because it's very small, and so the cost of entry is tiny. Listen, if you don't like it, spit it into the napkin and throw it out. The trash can's right there. But if you like it, and so that's tiny, right? But if you like it, how big is the thing that they're going to sell to you? Well, if it's like by me, they give you this tiny little piece of cheese on the toothpick, but the one they're selling is like a block. That's going to last me for a solid three months in the house. And in that moment is one of the greatest life epiphanies ever. Here's the deal. If you say to yourself, you know what? I'd really love to go kayaking. I think that is one of my callings is to, to try kayaking or rollerblading, whatever. Here's my tip for you. For the next two weeks, I want you to spend five minutes a day learning about that thing. So let's use kayaking as the example to stay consistent. So now you can do uh, YouTube videos about it. You can read a magazine about it. You can read articles about it, whatever you want, but just five minutes, literally at five, you set a timer on your phone at five minute oh one, you have to stop. Okay. Now what's going to happen during those two weeks? Well, A, your unconscious mind is going to look at someone in a kayak and see how happy they look. And it's going to start connecting the dots. It's going to be like, oh, look, that's a man. I'm a man. Okay, that seems somewhat safe. Look how happy they are. We want to be happy. Okay, that's a really good thing. Hey, they're wearing a shirt. We have shirts. Maybe this isn't as dramatic of a shift as we think it is. All right, so at the end of two weeks, you're going to call me up or call John, who's your coach, or Stu, who you're working with. And you're going to be like, okay, guys, please, can I have six minutes at least? Like, I love doing this every single day. Give me more time. Okay, you're as the coach. You're going to be like, all right, I'll give you 10 minutes, 10 minutes. But under no circumstances are you allowed to get in a kayak. Absolutely not. Okay. They're going to call you at the end of the next two weeks. And they're going to be like, geez, will you please let me go sit in the kayak? This looks so oh, freaking amazing, right? And you're going to say, here's what I'm going to allow you to do. I'm going to allow you to go talk to someone in a kayak store or at a kayak rental place, but you are still not allowed to get in the kayak. So sure enough, you're loving this whole thing. You go and you go talk to someone in the kayak store. They're like, well, you should go down to the river. Talk to Joe. He's got the kayaks right there. You go talk to Joe. Joe says, well, listen, why don't you just get in one for a couple of minutes? I'm more than happy to let you try it out. But your coach has said you can't do it. Well, at this point, what is your brain screaming to you that it wants to do? Get in yeah, the kayak, right? So now you've gone from where your brain is absolutely resisting everything that you want to try to pulling you in the direction of enabling you to try it. All of that from a simple sample at a grocery store. But if you apply that in your life, holy cow, is that just a complete game-changing experience to the way that you approach right. and fulfill your life? I, I love what you just said. You know, one of the things I'll just kind of layer layer on something that I tell people, which I think is sometimes we get, I see people as a coach getting stuck in just old patterns, right? Patterns that have expired. I, what I say to people is, you know, when you buy a carton of milk, it expires and then you have mm -hmm. to go out and buy a new one. When you download an app from, um, from the, uh, from, from the iTunes store, it expires at some point and you have to upgrade the app right? It takes one yep. second and you, it, it refreshes it and makes it brand new. Sometimes we need to actually remember that we need to realize what has expired in our life. It doesn't work for us anymore. Kind of spend that 30 seconds that instead of upgrading the app, upgrade ourselves to kind of get into the mindset that we, we can do, we can, and we, we should be doing this. I, I love the, I love your examples. I love that. And I'll tell you, the more you do it, the easier it is. Uh, yeah. The, and the, the more time you put in between, the more stress and the more fear that kind of surfaces about that. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Another great example of that is if I, so let me, Sue, give me an example of something that you love to do. I love to ride my bike. Okay, great. And I joined a cycling club and I kind of made the loop that you talked about, but now I'm at a point that I don't want to do it the same way that I did a year and a half ago. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Dissatisfaction, the first step to enlightenment. And so here you are doing something that you loved. And now all of a sudden, it's not quite as fulfilling as it used to be. And this gives you the chance to level up. And so right. I think that's awesome. You have that self awareness to say this is the next phase of that. And now you can open up the, 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 the window and say, well, what could that look like? Maybe I'm going to go on a bike tour of Italy. 
the, my dream <laughs> that there is on the dream yeah. list. <laughs> and and I is. guarantee you right now, someone is on a bike or in Italy. And so why not it, you? It exists. It yeah. exists. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to spend five minutes a day researching the bike tour in Italy till I can <laughs> feel comfortable that I can go. Yeah. Do it. Yeah. Yeah. You, I kid you not. That's if you use an exact process, literally by the time six weeks are up, your brain will be screaming for you to let you get on a bike and pedal through Tuscany. Yeah. Let's talk I'm about you know, it. So, I mean, and let me tell you one more thing, Sue, about yeah, that. So, since you love to ride your bike, and that's a really good example. If I said to you at this point, because you are an avid bike rider, uh, Sue, you can't ride your bike for the next six months, you would fight me on that, right? If John, John yeah. being your coach, you would fight him on that. But if you hadn't ridden your bike for six months, and then John said, listen, as your coach, I'm not going to let you ride your bike for six months, you'd be like, okay. Like, it just wouldn't have the same feel. And this is why, right. to your Absolutely. point, John, the more we are refreshing the app, the more we are yeah. staying connected to what we love, the less likely we are to be willing to sacrifice all of that for pleasantly occupied. Yeah. Perfect. You know, John, I, I love everything that you talk about, and I love this about the book. Um, some of my favorite books are the now yours, and yours is in line with The Go-Giver, if you've read that book. Um uh, the Alchemist, right? Mm -hmm. Books that tell beautiful stories. Um, I could name a few more. The Richest Man in Babylon. They tell beautiful stories. And the messages are so simple, they're complicated. And so <laughs> how do how do people, what's the first step? And you talked about awareness in this, but what is really that first step? And you shared kind of the five minutes a day. But even before the five minutes a day, what is that first step to get them you know, I'm a I'm a business coach. I work with successful people who are stuck and get them unstuck. So I always love the guests to give kind of really some advice on how to get that initial stuck unstuck. So what's that first unstuck to get people even into the into the space of enlightenment, into that first space of like getting out of their own way and tripping over themselves? Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's an experience that people go through that is two days that helps them get clear on their big five for life. And that's one way to do it. My way was I went and backpacked around the world for a year. Um, another thing we talked about was the time every day for a week, just asking that question, why am I here? So those are all very effective techniques. In addition to that, uh, I would say, depending on the person, depending on where they're at, sometimes you have to get rid of the things that you know are not working and open up space so that you can allow the new stuff to come in. This can be something as simple as going into your closet because this is a very tactical and very uh, tactile, which for some people, that's why it's so effective. Go into your closet and whatever's in there that you haven't worn in three years, just donate it. You're not going to wear it. And so open up some space in the closet. Uh, if you literally have no physical space when you walk into your arena, whatever it is, your closet in the morning, your countertop, uh, and the, and the first thing when you're brushing your teeth, your office at the desk, I find when everything is massively cluttered and constricted and full, it's very difficult to allow the creativity to flourish for me. And so if that's also something that connects with you as a listener, then again, just clear some space. So that's in your physical space. I would recommend the same thing in your calendar. Um, I like to encourage people to literally take a look at their, their daytime or their calendar or their phone, whatever they keep their schedule on. And if you look at the next seven days, I want you to really consciously ask yourself, this item, does it relate to my big five for life? And if the answer is no, cross it off and replace it with something that does. Uh, even if you just do that for an hour a day for an entire week and you fill it with something, even if you don't know for sure that it's related, but you think it's related, it will literally change the way that you feel seven days later dramatically. Yeah. And so that can be something very simple, very tactical that helps you get there. But I love that question, who's living my dream life? Yeah. And why? Why Why do I think that's my dream life? Oh, they seem happier. They seem more athletic. You know, you talked about playing sports or we talked about that. Maybe it's that they spend more time outside. I don't know because the answer is going to be different from ever, for everybody. But asking that question, who's living my dream life and why is that my version of a dream life? And in what way can I just incorporate it an hour a day of something like that? I love it. Yeah. And don't think it requires a lot of money either. One of the exercises I have people go through is if you had 5 million bucks given to you because you won the lottery, what would you do tomorrow? 
And I've never met a person in all the thousands who have gone through the courses who, when I look at what's on their list, there is not a way to do that today for zero cost. Yeah. <laughs> Everybody always thinks it's about money. Yeah. It's a nice it's way for our brain to saving keep us doing for the same retirement. Thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? yeah. Saving for retirement. That's all that's drilled to you is that, you know, you'll get there someday and then you end up on the island of someday and surrounded and never off it. Totally. And I got lucky, Sue, because I, I, I chucked it all and left at 32. And that showed me this other perspective. Had I have not done that, I'm sure that I would have been on the same basic yeah. path. So that's what I mean. Touch touch those real life experiences as soon as possible, uh, because otherwise you sort of pay the price down the line. I love that. Tell us more about when the big five. Oh, sorry. Hey, yeah, Sue, I was going to ask the same thing. Yeah. You know, exact same question. I would love to hear more about what are the big five. Yeah, so this was a wicked cool experience I had. Uh, one of the life-changing places that I visited during my travels was Africa. It's something I dreamed about since I was a little kid. And uh, for those of you that have been there, you're familiar with what's called the African Big Five. If you're not, it's five specific animals that people talk about constantly when they are on photo safari. And they gauge the success of their safari experience based on did you see them? And so if you see three of those, pretty good. Four of those, better. If you see all five of the African big five, it is Nirvana. It is like, that is exactly what I came here for. And when I came back from my travels and the cafe on the edge of the world started to take off and started to hit bestseller lists and I started to get asked to speak, I was really stuck. I was like, I don't know what I'm going to talk about because I'm not a speaker. Uh, I don't want to get up there and read the book. That would be terribly boring uh, to just be standing at a podium reading. And for some reason, I was in the shower one morning and it struck me this idea of the African Big Five. And I thought to myself, wow, what if we were to look at our lives that way? What if I literally sat down and figured out the five things that I most want to do, see, or experience in my lifetime before I die? The five things that if I did saw or experience them, that I can look back over my life no matter when it ends. And I could say, you know what? No matter what else I got to, I got to those things. And therefore, my life was a success by my own definition of success. Everything on top of that, bonus. But those five are the ones that are really going to define for me whether my life is everything that I wanted it to be. And then what if I was to align my resources, all of my money, all of my time, all of my energy, all of my thoughts on those five things? And I'll tell you what, the more I thought about it, again, I had this sort of same mental thing like, wow, I can't believe in my entire 30 plus years on the planet, I never had anybody ask me that. And I learned that it's just not part of the everyday conversation for most people, not because they're not thinking it though. This is what was so amazing. Almost everybody's thinking it. How do I get out of the rat race to go live a life that is more fulfilling? But it just wasn't part of the daily conversation. And so the more I started to apply that, the more I discovered what I call the cosmic algorithm of the universe. I can't explain to you exactly the way in which all of these things work. But if you think about Google, so if I get on Google and I type in purple cows with polka dots, it's amazing how much stuff I'm going to get filtered my way that has to do with purple cows with polka dots because these algorithms start looking at the way you're spending your time and what you're thinking about and giving you more of that. I have discovered in my life that there is something very similar going on under the scenes of humanity, of life. And so if I'm sitting at a desk all day doing a job that I don't like, and I'm spending 10 hours at that, that the cosmic algorithm is going, well, I don't know why John loves it so much. His back is killing him. He's missing his kid's baseball game. He's frustrated with his life, but for he's a, he's a creature of free will and he keeps doing it. So the dude must love it. I can't figure out why, but he must live it. So being a benevolent algorithm will give him more of that. And the next thing you know, the 10 becomes 12. The 12 becomes 14 hours a day. And so it's really important that we're very careful about not just what we're saying we want in our life, but what we're demonstrating to the algorithm that we truly want to have as our existence. Yeah. I love what you're talking about. You know, one thing that comes to mind right now, John, with inflation and um, the cost of things going up, you know, I think sometimes, you know, there's there's people who can afford to do certain things and then there's certain people who maybe the time frame is going to be a little bit longer but can you talk about regardless of your you know your your economic status you know how 
to, to have long-term intention, right? That things, you know, how do you stay consistent when your dream may be a year away or five years away? And also, you know, when when some may be a day away, but but how do you kind of talk to the person who needs that extra time because they need to put food on the table? Sure, you know, sure. they have responsibilities, they have families. How do you keep it alive? Uh, so I'll give you, I'll tell you the answer through a story because I have people asking me something very similar very often uh, because of their particular economic situation. And I want to stress that when I backpacked around the world, I did it on less than $40 a day. So it's not like I was out there staying in super nice hotels, but the dream of seeing the world was so significant to me that where I laid my head at night didn't matter. Uh -huh. I'd rather have the experience than be staying in a, a five-star experience that because that mattered more to me. Uh, but this great story. So a woman who went through the Big Five for Life Discovery course and decided that she wanted to go to Africa with her family. Uh, they're from the Netherlands. And so they looked at their savings. They looked at their life and said, OK, here's how much it's going to cost to actually go. And here's how much we think we can save with our everyday savings. And it was going to take them about five years. So then they got creative and they said, well, what would it take to get us there 12 months from now? And there is something very, very powerful in the cosmic algorithm about drawing the line in the sand. And when you say, I'm going on this day, all of your thoughts, all of your actions start to align to make that happen. But if you leave it nebulous, like, oh, I'd love to go someday, right? It just doesn't work the same. So because they drew the line in the sand, they said, we want to go in the next 12 months. What can we do to get there? And they're like, wait a minute. How much money do we spend on Christmas and birthday presents every year? And they totaled it up and they had a conversation with their as a family and said, what's more important to us? The birthday presents, the Christmas presents are going to Africa for two weeks on safari. Unanimous in the family. Let's go to Africa. Right. OK, well, that big chunk of cash is now reallocated towards the safari experience. And they did this two or three different ways. One of them was with I think they, they saved some money on gas every day with their car and the way that they drove and using bicycles, which is more common in the Netherlands. They, they came up with like four or five very creative ways to take money that they were already spending and reallocate it. And that is what happens when you have this intention of this is something that's totally, totally important to me. Now, John, how do you keep it top of mind? The answer is sort of in the question. If you had the line in the sand and you said, yeah, I'd love to go in December and it's January 1st, but I never revisit that dream until December 1st. I'm probably not going to be super motivated and pleasantly occupied will suck my time, suck my energy yeah. and suck my other resources. But if I buy myself a copy of Lonely Planet, which is the backpacker's guide to the world, and every night I'm reading about Africa, you could not pull me off of that dream with a thousand cranes and a thousand strongmen because now it's locked in. I can't wait to go. I'm reading about this cool stuff every day. I'm watching videos on YouTube of people on safari and my brain is going, that has got to be part of our story. Yeah. I love it. Thank you for that. Thank yeah. you for that. Sue, any thoughts? I just feel like I'd really have to start spending my five minutes a day. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I yeah. do. I like that. That resonated with me because I do have a way to get where I need to go. But I, I often don't put myself first and I let others, that was something else you had in your book about other people control your life than you controlling your life, right? Yeah, yeah. Let me throw one thing your way, Sue, because I can tell just from the brief time that we've spent together that you are a kind, compassionate, heartfelt person. And my guess, correct me if I'm wrong, but my guess is that you have an easier time helping others than accepting help from people. Oh, all, right? all day. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. right. Okay. All right. So let me see if I can change your life in about 30 seconds. Sue. Uh, and first of all, thank you for being that kind of a person. The world's kindness and compassion uh, grows when we see people being kind and compassionate. So the fact that you are that is what makes this world a better place. So now let's see if I can even out the scales to make sure that you get the life that you want to live as well. So Sue, why, why do you do that? Why do you enjoy helping people? Well, it makes me feel good. Beautiful. Yeah, makes you feel good. Yep. And uh, so, Sue, those people who would like to help you, uh, why are you being so selfish in regards to them? <laughs> I always think they don't really want to do it. 
Oh, but and mean. by the way, Sue, I state this from someone who struggled with this for three decades before it finally kicked through my thick head. Sue, those same people who want to help you, they want to feel good too. And if you let them help you, you'll be letting them feel the same joy that you get when you help other people. They wouldn't offer if they didn't want to. And let me tell you something else. You know why? You know when people really love to help? They love to really help when they know it's one of the five things that you most want to do, see, or experience in your lifetime before you die. Because when they get to help on one of those things, it makes their hearts sing. Understood. Understood. It's yeah. good. Back to when well, we right. started, John, when you first met me and we were doing, uh, I was passionate about joining this bike group. And that was when I got into it. And we were doing this huge fundraising to put clean water wells in a remote area of Africa. And I had never done anything like ride a bike across the state of Michigan ever in my life. I hadn't even rode 20 miles. And here you were going to do that for a day, 150 miles. And so many people joined in and supported me because they could see my passion for what I wanted to do. And when I met John was one of the first early times in that journey. And so many people jumped on. So what you're saying is very clear. Like, when you're passionate about it, people gravitate to you to be passionate with you and help you. Yeah. And, you know, I think about this. So first of all, fantastic. And anchor that thought next time you have a moment of your next time your brain has a mix. It's not you. It's your brain. Next time your brain has a moment of hesitation about asking for help, anchor it back to how wonderful the bike riding experience went and why it was wonderful, because it was something you cared about. And keep in mind that not everybody's able to bike 120 miles across the state of Michigan who also want to bring clean drinking water to Africa and you're the conduit they, you're, they're not going to be able to do it, but you're enabling them to be part of it. And that's wonderful. Thank mm -hmm. you. Yeah. I, I'm going to remember that it, it becomes more clear when somebody tells you and you're like, Oh, I did that. <laughs> totally. Why am I well, not? I can't tell you, the number of blind right. in front of me in my life is like massive, but it, so it's wonderful when other people are able to help us deconstruct those things. And, and I'll tell you yeah, another great one. Moment. <laughs> yeah. For anybody who's listening and saying, well, wait, I have that same thing going. John had it. He talked about it. Stu had it. Ask yourself the question, why? Why is it so much more difficult for me to accept help than to give help to others? And I guarantee you it's part of your life story. There was a defining moment somewhere in your life experience that anchored that. And it's a false piece of truth that you keep going back to. Mine was... In my household, when I grew up, when you were asked, when someone offered to help you to do something, they were basically putting the chip on the table that they were going to cash in later. And so I learned early on as a kid, I don't want to accept the chip because I don't want to be on the hook later to have to help on something I don't necessarily care about. It was totally messed up. And once I finally understood that and cleared that, it made it a lot easier for my brain to embrace the fact that people did want to help on the stuff that mattered. Yeah. Excellent. That's excellent. That was so good. That was so good. You know, um, we all, you know, we we all carry. I, I learned this a long time ago. This kind of helped me when it comes to stuff you're talking about right now, John. You know, we carry. I think it's like four generations of lineage in our, you know, and so it's like to to break a habit, you know, is is hard because there's there's just so many other voices going on, you yeah. know, in, in in the head. We were, and um, we were talking about, uh, before we got started, a little bit about um, uh, a book, you know, Einstein's dreams kind of before. And But it is, it's true. And diving, spending time diving into those patterns that don't work. I mean, I've been in therapy for 25 years. They're not easy, but they're so necessary. And, you know, sitting back and observing just that conversation um, just kind of, really shows the importance of it too. So, and, and I'll yeah. give you an example, Sue. So uh, after the first, so I had the 21 days stream of conscious uh, typing experience where the story just, it flowed from out here through here, through my fingertips so fast. And I had, I had no plans to be an author. I had never thought about that. And, uh, but it, but it, when it over the 21 day, one days were done, it looked like a book. It felt like a book. And so I thought, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to turn this into a book. 
And I thought, well, if I turn it into a book, I need to let people know it exists. And so complete amateur that I was, here I am with literally printing off my printer, a big, thick manuscript. I cold called the editor of a magazine and I said, hey, I've got this book. I was wondering if you could do a piece about me or about it. And she was like, I'm sorry, what? <laughs> I mean, she, she was just <laughs> incredulous. But I stayed on the phone and I sort of told her about my story. I, I think basically I just wore her down over time. And she was like, okay, send me a copy of the book. And I was like, uh, I don't have a book, but I have a manuscript. Can I send you that? And I look now and I was such a complete amateur. Like there's no way an editor is going to take a manuscript and do something with it. Like what if it never gets turned into a book or what if the person never follows through, right? But she was like, okay, fine, send it to me. And so, and weirdly enough, I had, I had told my wife, she, when she saw me typing for the 21 days, she was like, what are you, what are you working on there? <laughs> you know, like, okay, what's going on? And I said, I don't really know, but I honestly feel like if one person reads it and it makes a positive difference, like the whole thing will have been worth it. So I send off this thick pages, you know, 160 pages to this person. I call her up a week and a half later. She did not even remember who I was when I got her on the phone. And I was like, oh my gosh, what a complete waste of an ink cartridge. And I don't know why I'm doing this. A day later, phone rings. It's this lady. She says, uh, we need to meet. Okay. That sounds kind of promising. Right. And so she, she set up a time at a restaurant. I go into the restaurant. I don't know her. She doesn't know me. I'm sitting at the table across from her. Again, this is the first person ever to read the completed manuscript. And her opening words to me are that little book has changed my life. And she starts telling me her story about how she was adopted and she always felt alone and never felt connected with her purpose. And 10 minutes into this, she's just bawling. She's just crying in front of me. And I'm looking around like, oh my God, is am I being set up or what's the deal? But it wasn't. And the reason that I share that story is because as it relates to the cosmic algorithm of the universe and you living your big five for life, there are going to be moments that are just so non-planned that reinforce that you are on the right journey, that you are on the right path. And these are the things to your question, John, that throughout my entire life as an author have kept me going. These yeah. moments when that random coincidence that says, actually, dude, this is exactly the path that you're supposed to be walking. Yeah, it's beautiful. And so look for those, Sue. Look for those little moments and journal them. Write them down so that when you're having a tough day, you can go back and be like, you know what, actually... There's something bigger at play here that really wants me to be successful and happy and, and living on purpose. Perfect. I will do that. I think about her all I think I about that lady all the time. I well, John, this would be great. I'm sorry, Sue. Are you... No, I was just saying I appreciate that. Oh, nice. I I appreciate, John, your time and your stories. Um, you know, everything that you shared was so beautiful. The book is so beautifully written, such an easy read, so many deep, simple, deep thoughts to get somebody um, to really take the reader on a journey of introspection, a journey of raising their awareness so they can really take the moments in the space to find their purpose and to find uh, more clarity on their path. And, you know, it's it's interesting. I, I, I talk to a lot of authors on this show and, you know, I've never talked to an author like you um, and this has really been my favorite. You're, you're the best author I've ever talked to because <laughs> you, you know, I can just tell you kind of walk your talk, your journey. I can see your life in the book, right? Just the energy of it. And so I'm really grateful for um, anybody who takes complicated things and tries to simplify it to give people tools to live their best life and get unstuck and always be on a quest to reach their highest potential. And, and your books, um, uh, they do that. And so I'm very grateful for, for that. Um, before you tell everybody how to connect with you, Sue, any closing thoughts? No, thank you both for your time and the opportunity to get to do this. I really did enjoy it and uh, I look forward to more. Sue, John, can you do me a favor? Sue, can you do me a favor? If you end up going on the bike ride, if you decide going on the bike ride in Italy is truly one of your big five for life, will you send me a picture? <laughs> I will absolutely do that. Thank you. Right. John, tell everybody how they can connect with you, learn more about you, buy all of your books, learn more about the big five for life uh, course and all that other great stuff. Yeah, absolutely. So I on my website, which is my name, johnstrelecki.com. So J-O-H-N. 
S T R E L E C K Y dot com. And I'm on all social media channels where we post uh, inspiring stuff. Uh, as it comes to me, there's some really actually pieces of intellectual capital and articles that I've written that I post on my own website on my blog, things that have not made it into books, but things that like had a profound impact on my life and all that's available to just to read for free. So feel free to check that out as well. That's great. Well, John, thanks. Uh, this was an absolute pleasure. Sue, great co-hosting with you. Uh, Thank thanks you, John. for, you know, bringing this book into my life and John, thanks to your group for bringing you to both of us and everything that you're doing for the world. Thank you so much. Right back um, at you. Thank you. Great. Thanks everybody. Have a great day.